just a good old boy. I've got a story to tell you that just happened to me. I nearly just got my killing. It was bad. I mean, I, I ain't been that freaked out in a long time. It ain't much that serves me up. But I was flipping out. Woo! We just got here. I rolled up a little section right here in case you wanted to park the trucks. But we just got here to this field, and I was about two miles from here. Going in a turn. And I look over right before I go in the turn, I just happen to notice something out of the corner of my eye. And as I'm going down there, I look over and I see it. It's like right here. I'm like, what in the world? Now look, first I thought it was just a dirt dog. I was like, well, that ain't just a dirt dog. I ain't worried about it. I ain't worried about a dirt dog. So, and then I take a second look as it turns, and I'm like, what in the God's name is this thing? And I look, and it's this huge black bug that's kind of shaped like a large, large, large wasp. Like almost as big as a Japanese hornet. But it's black. It's jet black. And this thing had this funky looking head on it. And a large loop that looked like wire. It was th it's a thin loop on its butt, and it was red, and it looked like uh, a stinger. And its red was all, I, I couldn't really tell, I just seen it out of the corner of my eye, but it looked like it's a bunch of different colors on the rear end, but the front half of it, just the very rear end of it, was black. And this thing had this loop of a, of a loop on its butt, and I was like, what the heck is this thing? So I figured, well, I'm gonna get this thing off of me. So I reached over to do this number. I flick it off. Well, I'm coming down the road. I'm just driving along, minding my own business. I flick his bug off. I'm thinking, well, I got rid of him now. He, he'll, he'll lay over and kind of be not silly for at least till I get there and then I kill him. No. Uh-uh. This thing goes ballistic. It starts flogging my face, in my eyes, all over my ears, on my neck, my nose, my whole face. I am flipping out in this truck trying to get this bug that I've never seen before in my life. I mean, this thing looked like something from a horror film. I'm flipping out, throwing my hat off, trying to hit it with my hat, trying to jerk my sunglasses off because I thought it landed on my face. I was just doing this. My sunglasses went flying in the cab. My hat went flying in the cab. I had this thing around my neck, it landed on that one time right here, and I went like that, and it went flying it through the cab. I had a, had a bottle laying there, I was trying to hit it with a bottle, it went flying through the cab. I mean, hell, everything was flying around the cab, including me. Truck run off the road, partially. Dad's, a car, there's a car between me and Dad behind me. He's watching this whole thing. I'm all over the road, he said. I'm just going in and out. He said, the truck goes off a little bit off the road, I drop off the road a little bit, I pull it back up on the road and everything, and he's like, what the heck? I'll tell you that part in a minute. And I'm just flipping out trying to get rid of this bug. Finally, it it comes right here, it's trying to sting me, and every time it gets close enough to me, I hit it with something and knock it away. Well, finally, it got right here, and it was just about, I reckon, to sting the shit out of me. And I reached, and I went, woof! Like that, and that thing went flying out the window. I thought my hat was gone. I could not find my hat anywhere in in the truck coming on down the road the rest of the way. I thought it went out the window. I was looking for everything. I thought, oh God, my darn sunglasses have gone out the window. Everything's went out the window because the windows are all open because there's no AC that works worth the flip on that truck. And I'm just flying, trying to get this thing away from me because I don't know what it is. So I pull in here, and we get here, and I jump out of the truck, and I'm looking for this thing to make sure it's still on the truck or on me. Cause I, could, I thought it, I threw it out the window, but I couldn't find it or see it anywhere in the cab, so I wasn't sure. And after the other day when I got stung with that dang bumblebee, I've been kind of a little freaked out with bugs. That there dang crap hurt for two or three days after that. And, uh, 
So I can't find his bug. Dad pulls up. He's right, literally right behind me. So he just gets out of the truck and right me under a tree limb, about to tear the top of the baler and the tractor off. Anyway. He's like, what in the world happened up there on the road? He said, I thought you blew a tire, was losing control of the truck and everything. He said, man, you was all over the road. He said, you nearly took out a mailbox. I said, you come off the road. He said, they, there's a car coming. He said, I thought I was scared to death you go in that car. I said, it's a goddamn bug trying to kill me. <laughs> he said, what? I said, there's a dang bug trying to kill me. I ain't never seen nothing like this thing before. <laughs> He just started shaking his head. He said, dang, I thought there's something bad wrong. Or it, uh, like something happened to the truck the way you was driving. He said, I didn't know what was going on. I was like, I dirty. He said, you about scared me too. I said, you already been me. <laughs> oh, God. I swear I lost 10 years on that one. Woo, that thing freaked me out. I mean, it was mad, boy. I mean, it was not even playing around. It was just trying to get my face any way it could. It, if it wasn't my arms, it wasn't nothing. It was trying to get my face. I don't know where all these dang weird bugs is coming from in the last 10 years. My God. We have some of the weirdest things. We got these things now here. They they look kind of like a wasp, but they're, they, they're, they have legs like a spider and all kinds of crap. And these things are weird looking. And then they got... Uh, there's some other kind of uh, the stink bugs. We are infested with stink bugs. And I, as a kid, they didn't nobody have these little brown, round shaped stink bugs that are uh, another thing. Then back last year, when I was deer hunting, there's a long, skinny, little curly tailed black thing that uh, was funny shaped and it had them little spider legs, but this thing was tiny. It bit the crap out of me when I was in my hay bale blind. I was flipping out. I didn't know if this thing was poisonous or what. I finally found it and found out that it wasn't poisonous, but it, it said that wherever it bit you, poisonous enough to kill you anyway. It said wherever it bit you, though, it would hurt bad. And it did. It hurt like like a, uh, like that, nearly like that dang mummy that stung me the other day. It lingered there for a while. It wasn't a, uh, hard pain it was just a lingering annoyance pain and uh man they, these things here lately they are freaky the way they these things look i don't know where they're coming from we didn't have any of these dang things here when i was a kid they wasn't here when my dad was a kid all this crap's new and it's like they're they're turning this stuff loose or something and it's weird it's like uh I know they, they turn that kudzu bug, it's a little green thing, looks like a ladybug, but it, they're supposed to eat kudzu loose, the government did. Heck, that dang things, they ain't done nothing to killing off a kudzu. That's a joke. They eat everything else. I think, I wish they'd quit turning these things out. And I mean, it freaked me out. I was like, what the heck is it? If it had even been a wasp. I mean, I, it wouldn't have freaked me out as bad as not knowing what the thing is, because you never know. There's a lot of these things that I've seen here lately. If they bite you or sting you, it can, it can be pretty bad. It, it could uh, hospitalize you or something else. Because I, when I went looking for these things that's been biting me or something here lately, the last couple years, I see all these other bugs that's listed on now in North Georgia in areas around here, and I'm like, what the heck is that thing? This thing, I had never seen nothing like this thing before. It was freaky looking. Whew. God, money. And last year it didn't get cold enough. I mean, it was cold here, but it wasn't. There wasn't a hard, hard freeze enough to where it would kill all these dang insects and snakes. We've got snakes something awful this year. I don't know how many of them I've killed out in the hay fields this year. It's weird. I mean. I killed black snakes, racer snakes, uh, king snakes, uh, I mean, you name it, uh, copperheads, all kinds of there and stuff. I've killed all how many of them this year, and that man, they, whew, they some darn stuff out there right now. I ain't, it normally don't bother me that bad. 
I reckon that bumblebee upset me the other day when it stung me like that, and I didn't know where it was coming from, what it was, or where it was at. Boy, I mean, that tore me up in that truck. I thought I was going to die. But I, didn't get, I nearly jumped out of the damn truck, if you want to know the truth. I was close to it. Boy, it, I, it freaked me out. Anyway, we're rolling hay today. This is our hay here. It's a little patch we got of cow hay. Well, it ain't little, but I mean, little, little, but it ain't just for what we normally do for our own in a week. It ain't amounting to much this week. Um, I did cut hay yesterday on Friday, though. Um, I'm planning on trying to bail it Monday if it don't rain today. Hey, they said no rain. Now all they're talking about is thunderstorms today and everything else, so. And then the cow thing the other day. Dad said, you did good on your talk, but you should have told everybody that they got to bust up these Packer Monopolies to do any good. And I said, well, I've said that I don't know how many times and I don't know how many videos post them on Facebook, YouTube everything. I said, I'm getting tired of repeating the same thing. If they don't do no good, they don't know why even try to do that. What few does try, and you know, to do anything. He's like, well, you gotta tell them. Alright, I'll tell them. But he's right. Hey, until they get anything done with it, ain't, ain't worth talking about. But we're in a world market now. We can move. It is fast. One, one person messaged me and said, well, It'll help us because they're going to move the beef so much faster and it'll it'll take some of the staleness out. Well, I told him the same thing. I said, yeah, it may, but it don't do any the producers any good at all. I said, because they just keep pouring more and more uh, foreign meat in here to drive the flood to markets with beef to keep the price down. I said, that's all. Well, there's got to be a shortage created to do us any good. And uh, that's it. That's the, just the way it is, and uh, the percentage is, I mean, it's so, there's so much crap that I, it would take a three to four or five hour video just to explain it all, and I don't even think I could get it all in then. It would still be something I would miss. But if you really want to hurt them, you gotta, we've got to get behind country of origin. I think it would benefit everyone, not just here in the United States, everybody. And I mean, when I say country of origin, I say that they make it to where every country can legalize it. The World Trade Organization, they were so kind to take it away from us. They should go back and revisit this subject and make it to where it's legal for every single country in the world to be able to label their product. That's only, that's just fair. Not, not label it and then let other people take advantage of that and use that to their advantage and then put fake labels on them. They need to allow them to have, they need to make it to where there is a requirement that everything is labeled truthfully and not falsely. And right now, there's no way to enforce that whatsoever. Unfortunately, every other industry in the world, if you did that, there could be a lawsuit there, but not in the cattle industry, not in the more. But, I mean, it's, it's a mess. Um, I do not support cattle ID. That's one thing a lot of people are probably thinking, well, if you want country of origin, you probably want cattle ID. No, I do not. I actually, That video I actually did the other day was actually 40 minutes long, and I went through all this, but I figured it was going to be too long, and nobody would want to watch 40 minutes worth of video, so I cut it out. I do not support cattle ID. They need to do away with the idea of cattle ID because all it's just more expense on the cattle producer and more advantages for, and, and there's still no requirement, even if you do cattle ID, for the packers to be uh, truthful on the packages when they ship it out. Um, it's another thing too. If there's no mandate for country of origin, even with the cattle ID, if it's not worded in there, uh, they can still twist it ever how they want and it does no good. They're pushing for cattle ID for one reason and one reason, not, well, two reasons, but the main reason is, is the Packers are pushing hard to get cattle ID, which they wanted it when Cool was in, 
That was something that they were trying to push for. Deb told me yesterday, he said, you need to explain that. He said, be careful what you wish for. Sometimes you might get what you wish for. And he's right. We need to go about this in a specific way. We do not need country of origin ID, or, or not, not country of origin, cattle ID specifically. We don't need it. In the U.S., we can track it back through the livestock barns, all that crap, paperwork, whatever they can, any, pretty much anywhere the beef is from, and track down pretty accurate where it come from. They did it, they've done it for years, they can still do it now, it's, it's ridiculous. The whole thing with cattle ID is for nothing but a census to know exactly how much beef on the hoof accurately without lies or without hidden cattle or anything know exactly what's out there. So that way these people, or the packers and the people that's, that's betting on the commodities and everything have a better hold and grip on exactly what the market's going to do and expect so that way there's they can uh, manipulate the markets further and bet on them further the way they want them to go. It's going to extremely benefit the packers is the issue with that and all the expense is going to be on cattle producers. You do not need a cattle ID system set up in a country to know that it's from your own country. There's no point. We already know our cattle are from here and they're here. The simple way to do that is any cattle that goes into another country once they enter that country, they are put into a holding facility by the company that is buying those animals because it's their end that they're making the money on those animals once they kill them and everything else. Has to put them in a facility at the border crossing and tag those animals from the country that they are coming from. That is the logical way to do it. It should not be put on the person who's producing the animal in their own country to have to do this. The people who are looking to know and are uh, on that end are benefiting off of that system are the people that, <coughs> that import the cattle, not the producer. The producer should not have to eat that cost. It's not fair for the producer to eat that cost. The producer is already eating all the cost and the expense and the risk and everything as it stands on the cattle at this point anyway. So it does the producer no good and it's not even his place to need to do that. Our cattle are known where they come from. If you're in Canada, your cattle are known that they're Canadian. If you are in Mexico, your cattle are known that they're Mexican. It's very simple. It's, they need facilities at the points of entries for if it's whatever how it's funded I don't know but it should not be on the backs of the cattle producers when they come in here that they are ID at that point not put where the cattle producers in that country have to ID their cattle from the time they hit the ground and everything tag them and everything else to know that that cow is from there. There's no point in it. It's stupid. It's just another way for cattle markets to be manipulated, farmers and ranchers to be taken advantage of, to fill the burden and take the cost for the larger packers and the buyers that are buying the cattle to have to not absorb. We already take enough risk as it is. We should not have to have that dumped on us as well. And it's bullshit. They know where those cattle come from. They don't want to have to bear the expense to haul them in here. Is what it all boils down to. They're the ones selling the beef on that end. They need to bear the cost. I shouldn't have to pay the cost so that way they don't have to. The biggest problem with that is, is the fact that most people in the cattle industry are not going to go out that's got X amount of cows, like a lot of pl uh, places do out west, and catch every calf and it, when, as soon as they're born and tag them. It's not logical for people around here to do that because they've got so many farms in so many different areas. Most of the people that has cattle on the eastern side, co east coast side, are older people who are in their 60s and 70s or in that range, they are not going to take the time to do that. They're not going to do it. They'll just sell them and get out, and they'll be done with it. 
and that's going to kill the cattle industry here in the U.S. You'll see the numbers fall just instantly overnight. It'll drive the price up. Well, it would. Let me rephrase that. Under the current situation, it would not drive the price up because we have no. They just keep letting more and more animals in here from somewhere else. So it would not have any effect at all. It would, however, have probably a slight, small, very small effect on the world market by that many cattle just all of a sudden drying up. But it would be little to nothing. See, that's the problem with the world market. The world market is a large, large market. So it takes a drastic impact to make the world market change versus your own country's market. That's the problem. That's why I say it doesn't matter what we do here. Uh, Farming 4G made a very good point. He's talking about all the cows that, that passed this year and that died due to flooding and everything and all, all that went on with that. It's had no effect on the cattle markets whatsoever. None. They passed an agreement just like what they're doing with Europe, uh, with Japan already, had absolutely no effect on the market. It's not going to have any effect at all because it doesn't matter. The only way we're going to see any change at all in our markets is if it's a world market shift drastically, which is little to no, no chance at all. Where we are today, unless we can bust up the monopoly that the Packers have and get country of origin back in, which would be just getting country of origin passed without cattle ID would be a drastic blow to the monopolization that the Packers have here in the United States. Drastic. I mean, it would. we would see our markets go back up 40 to 50 percent like they were before it came off. We would see probably a four to five hundred dollar per cat increase in our prices today at the uh, cattle auction barns like they were before for a 500 pound cat. That would be what your impact would be if we just had that one thing. It's been proven. We have it. We have it documented. It worked for, for several years, but it was done away with because the packers and the feedlots were not patient enough for people to get back into cattle here in the United States, which they were doing, to make the cattle numbers grow up. The cattle numbers prices, I've said this before, would have failed some after the numbers came up and it would kind of level back off a little bit but it would not have been the drastic 40 to 50 percent market loss we are today and we would have been in a lot better condition today than we were then but they were greedy and they did not want to wait and, and quite frankly if we would have had this years ago and we would have had fair trade deals all this time and our cattle numbers would have stayed up and the markets wouldn't have been the crap that, like they are right now they would be a lot more people in the cattle industry. And I'll tell you something else, too. That would help grain farmers quite a bit because it takes a lot of feed to feed those cattle. In the long run, here in the United States, for the cattle feeders, for everybody, grain farmers, for the people in the beef industry, we would have been far, far better off if we would have left country of origin labeling in place. And quite honestly, I think that also in other neighboring countries next to us would have been farther better off because if our cattle are that high their cattle even if they're off by a hundred dollars per animal isn't it a lot better to get nine hundred dollars for a 500 pound calf instead of i'm guessing the mark being in their markets or world markets too better than the four at least 30 to 40 percent market loss that y'all have right now I'm guessing that's where their cattle at, are at. If not, if there's something drastically wrong. So in return, it actually hurt us all. And I'm not against Canada being able to label their beef in their country, USA, Canada, or whatever. I'm saying as a world place, where every country should withhold the right to label their products with their name. I don't care if it's Europe. I don't care if it's Mexico. I don't care if it's Brazil. I don't care where it's at. Everybody should have the right to label their name on that product. If they don't want to label their name, that's fine. They don't have to stamp anything on it. But it should be a requirement if it's stamped at least. I would like it if it was a requirement, period, to have to have that on there. And it be a mandate that everything has to be labeled all around the world where it's from. That would be the best way to go without cattle ID. Do it the way I said to do it. 
it would be the best way to go as a whole all around the world because then we could individually make our own industries better if Canadian cattle are better if Mexican cattle are better if Japanese if Australian Brazilian whatever is better it automatically gets the better price the way things are currently nobody's gaining nobody's gonna make anything off. but the only people making or gaining anything off of this is the packers and the in the packing industry because they own pretty much every packing house all around the world and it's basically the same four that own them all around the entire world and that's the basic that's the gist of it. that's how they don't care what happens they're basically using this as tools to keep manipulating markets to where they can go in, they can take beef that's cheaper, they buy from one country, sell it in another country where it's currently still high, and they just keep manipulating and gaining that what's in the place, because they're still selling the beef at the same price, say U.S. is $2 higher than than uh, Mexico's cows. They sell it, they're the beef pack. Say you got a pound of beef. Let's just say this. All right, let's put it in simple terms what they're doing. That pound of beef in Mexico brings a dollar. Just as an example, not saying it does. Say it brings a dollar, okay. Well, in the U.S., a pound of ground beef is bringing three dollars, okay. Well, if they can go over to Mexico and they can buy that beef for a dollar, they can bring it over here in the United States. They can stamp that same, uh, take that same package of meat that was only a dollar over there, bring it over here, pull the sticker off, Put a new sticker on that says product to USA on it. American people don't know no different. And they get three dollars. They're making the two dollars. That's more money in their pocket. Unfortunately, it floods the cattle industry with all that extra beef here, and there's not a, a, a as much of a demand, and it drives the markets down further here. Well, what they do then is then the cows that the package of meat that was that was actually worth three dollars here in the U.S. is now only worth the dollar that it was in Mexico. So now they're charging, still charging three dollars. So now not only are they making the two dollars that they were making off of the beef that they got out of Mexico bringing it in here, now they're also making two dollars on the beef that comes out of. Uh, that was already here in the United States. So they've gained two dollars across the board on every package of meat while the markets in the, at the are still at sales charging the same thing in the grocery store making their two dollars while over here in the cattle industry the price keeps falling for the farmers and ranchers at the livestock farm because there's so much meat being flooded on the market. Now I'm making less money than I was then way less even though my expenses because our dollar value is more and everything's so much higher because the economy is doing so good right now here in the u.s is a lot more expensive than say in mexico not saying it is just using an example calm down say that is a lot more expensive there they're actually making a little bit more money than i do here and being our currency is actually a little bit stronger than theirs when they take it back to their home country and they get X amount of dollars here in the United States when you convert that back to their money they're actually making more money that way than we do here than we do here and gaining there so they're a little bit more easily not saying that they're glad to take what they're getting but it's not as quite as painful as what we deal with here uh, on our end because of it. you see what they're doing they're doing all this and there's nothing to stop them. There's the only thing that you can use to stop them is either stop lower the import percentages that come in here live and frozen. There's a difference. See, they don't count live animals that come in here. They only count uh, the frozen ones on the imported thing of the percentage that's allowed in here. So there's a difference. That's how they're getting around the percentage of what's actually allowed in here. They just ship them into, into those countries, and then from there, they ship them into here live. And that's just the way that works. Even though they're not from here, even though they didn't grow up underneath, uh, or raised underneath the same health inspection guidelines, it may not even be a Canadian's cow or Mexican's cow that's coming in here, but they have that access to get in here through that way.
And in fact, it hurts everybody. It hurts Canadians, it hurts the Mexicans, it hurts everyone. We all need to get together and bust up the monopoly that these Packers have. And I know every country has its problem. Everybody I've talked to from each one of these countries says we're dealing with the same thing you are, and we have been, and they all, everybody points the finger at the same people. Well, we all need to get together and do something about it to try to save the cattle industry around the world. And they don't care. They're pushing lab-grown meat extremely hard. Dad said they had it on a news show the other day, um, <clears throat> trying to promote it and uh, talking about how it tastes just the same as actual beef. That is, we're done, guys. If people start eating that and don't care, we're done. You, you can wipe us out, we're done. It's over with. It's over. It's already bad enough our markets are being manipulated like they are today, but that's over with. And I still say the end game here for the packing industry is they want to drive our markets down so low that they do us like they did the hog industry years ago that we all start to drop out and get out. And they're going to hold those markets down as low as they can until we finally start all just giving up and getting out to the point to where there's there's a large amount of money to be made there then they're going to come in and then they're going to come up with a plan kind of like the chicken growers or what they did with pigs and we're going to be growers i'm going to be a grower the land will be mine but they are going to own the animals and they'll bring them to me and i have to follow everything they want done step by step and they'll pay me basically nothing uh, at the end of it using my land and everything and it'll keep me set at an axe uh, at an income while they have full control over everything from the ground up. That's their end goal. This, the certification processes that they're pushing right now, like with cattle handling certifications, that's how it's starting. That's the first step of getting this kind of the ball rolling in this direction. And as the years go on, they're eventually going to get to where they'll implement all of it. But that's basically where we're at right now. Uh, currently with the cattle industry and what they're trying to do they're just trying they're trying to take it over and make us like uh, the chicken and pork industry which they've already done that's their end goal that's what they want to do all you, if you don't believe me on how much money they're making right now all you got to do is go look at their uh, their net profits and stuff at their when they put it out every year uh, or every quarter or if they could do quarters uh, on how much money they've made in dollar value through those companies. Those companies are, well, two of the big ones is Tyson and Cargill uh, are two of the big ones. I think uh, JBS is one. Uh, and I want to say there's another one called uh, is it Smithfields. There's another one. I can't remember it. Remember, there's actually really, I think there's four, there's four very large ones, and I think there's one other one that's pretty large. Uh, the little guys, the competition they had in the packing industry, they used to be a multitude of packers. Um, they bought them out, wiped them out, and took them out. Um, and they have a monopoly right now. They actually have a lawsuit on them by RCAF and uh, another group through the grocery store in, I think, uh, is suing them also. Uh, for manipulating the markets but it, they've got so much money back in them I don't know if it's gonna do any good or not uh, I hope it does but I don't know if it's gonna do any good um, and it's gonna be hard to prove between all of them they're all colluding between the four um, it is real and uh, we've all everybody across the world has got to get together and do something or otherwise none of us can market our beef is uh, period uh, we have no marketing we're in a global market now and that's just the way it is and uh, nothing's going to change as far as that goes uh, right now so thanks for watching please comment rate and subscribe